Professor Lucas Introna, who is Professor of Technology, Organisation and Ethics at the Centre for the Study of Technology and Organisation at Lancaster University. Uh, Professor Introna is co-editor of the journal Ethics and Information Technology and is a founding member of the International Society for Ethics and Information Technology. He has written, four, or written or edited four books in the area of information technology and organisation, most recently Beyond Interpretivism, New Encounters with Technology and Organisation. He's published regularly in some of the most prestigious journals in our area, including Theory, Culture and Society, Science, Technology and Human Values, MIS Quarterly and Organisation Studies. Professor Introna specialises in the ethics and politics of socio-material entanglements and therefore engages with some of the most fundamental uh, and thorniest issues confronting our understanding of digital technologies in society, such as how can we conceptualise the relationship between humans and non-humans? What's the moral status of agentic technical artefacts? What does it mean to take a post-humanist perspective on society? However, he always addresses these questions, uh, difficult questions, at the level of everyday situated practices. For example, in relation to the use of electronic medical records or facial recognition or plagiarism software. Uh, Professor Introna's work has been an inspiration for many, us, many of us in the DOS Research Centre and so we're delighted he's accepted this invitation for a virtual visit to discuss his current thinking on digital governance. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions of Professor uh, Introna at the end of his talk and as I said you could perhaps type them into the chat screen uh, and then uh, Inchin will facilitate that question asking process at the end. But right now I have great pleasure in handing over to Professor Introna. So I just want to get my slide back on here. Um, so uh, it's going to be very strange to talk to my computer <laughs> uh, and uh, I can see some faces. Uh, so I'm going to try and do my best to present this rather complicated topic in about 40 minutes. I'm going to show you slides, but I'm not always going to speak to my slides or through my slides. I might sometimes skip them. Uh, I have 26 slides, which is way too much. And the, in each slide, there's quite a lot of detail. Uh, so that's not going to be possible within the 40, 40 minutes or so that uh, I have available. So. Uh, I'm going to try and sketch, do a broad brush sketch of a complicated phenomenon and uh, hopefully we can unpack some of the detail in the question and answer session uh, and uh, uh, see where we go from there. So the central topic for my uh, presentation is the notion of the correlation machine. Uh, now this is a phrase that I got from uh, that I got from David Chandler. I think it's a really captures something important. Uh, and uh, the correlation machine is a particular form of digital governance. So I'll talk about digital governance, the correlation machine. I will highlight then, uh, I will highlight then uh, what I call correlational performativity. Uh, I'll use specifically example of plagiarism detection, but also talk, which I've done a lot of empirical work on, but then also highlight some issues in terms of machine learning. Uh, and then I would talk a bit about the normative political implications of uh, the correlation machine and digital governance as a form of uh, conducting or managing the conduct of, of others. So that's what I want to try and do in a very short period of time. So why should we take this issue sh seriously? So uh, we should take it seriously because uh, we have this sort of uh, this sort of uh, newspaper articles uh, capturing and framing the discourse, the narrative about AI or machine learning more generally. So powerful antibiotics discovered by AI the go master quits because AI cannot be beaten. Google DeepMind uh, says that the AI can detect a spot 
acute kidney diseases 48 hours before the doctors could do it. Uh, and this article from the, from the Guardian to say AI outperforms experts in spotting breast cancer. Now, what these things do is they create an imaginary of what uh, AI and machine learning can do. And this is then filled out in many terrains. So for example, you can imagine people thinking, well, if AI can outperform experts in spotting breast cancer, maybe it can outperform AI uh, experts in spotting criminals. Maybe it can outperform experts in spotting a terrorist, a fraudster. Or maybe it could just outperform uh, the experts in spotting a good high potential employee. Uh, so these sorts of possibilities do come up in people's imagination. And this translates into actual applications. So we know, for example, we have things like the higher view system that does facial scanning, uh, does gesture analysis, uh, speech analysis, and then filters applicants for jobs. So what these uh, technologies do is they make a distinction between a high potential applicant and an applicant that's not so good. Uh, we see ex examples, for example, of police trailing this technology to make distinctions about who should be bailed and who shouldn't be bailed. Or, there's the well-known example of the compass system by North Point that's used in the US by judges to make decisions about uh, how long the sentences is going to be, which is based on profiles about reoffending. So this, these systems make profound decisions about who is a criminal, who's not a criminal, who's likely to commit further crime, who's not likely to commit further crime, who's a good candidate, who's not a good candidate, et cetera, et cetera. So, these applications do exist and they are becoming more and more pervasive. Now you might say, well, that's just the press and it's, you know, it's still, uh, these systems are still tried, they're not so pervasive uh, and they, you know, they don't have the legitimacy that, uh, that accords them any serious consideration. Well, that might be true, but we also have, we also have people like the, um, behavior economist Daniel Kahneman, who wrote the famous book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, uh, and in a, a seminar on the economics of uh, AI, he made this statement, uh, seriously made the statement. He said, you should replace humans by algorithms wherever possible. Even when the algorithms don't do very well, humans do so poorly and are so noisy that you must, just by removing the noise, you can do better than people. We humans are narrow thinkers, noisy thinkers. It's very easy to improve on us. Okay, so this is, uh, this is somebody who ironically suggests that we should be doing slow thinking, uh, is suggesting that we can be replaced and should be, the system should be replaced by uh, these types of technologies because we are narrow, noisy thinkers. So this is a, the discourse, this narrative is, is very pervasive and even people in very serious academic positions are taking the view that algorithmic governance is a good thing. Uh, it's much better than human governance. Okay, so what do I mean by digital governance? This is just the trajectory of the talk. I'm not gonna go through that uh, in the interest of time, I'll just skip. Digital governance. So this digital governance is a notion I take from the work of David Chandler, who also coined the notion of a, of a correlation machine. And he says, digital governance understands problems in terms of their effects rather than their causation. The management of effects involves the re redistribution of agency to algorithms understood as responsive capabilities capacity. So it's the responsive capacity, it's the ability to respond there and then in the real world. That responsive capacity uh, based on effects is what is important and thereby evades or hides or conceals the question of responsibility or accountability for problems or the need to intervene on the basis of 
political decision making. Okay. Now, this is the example, or this is the, the correlation machine is an example of how digital governance works, and I'm hoping to unpack that. And if it's, that is the case, then the question arises, and which we get to the end, is if that is digital governance, and it's, and it's enacted through the social material assemblage, which is a distributed agency, where do we intervene in order to govern this digital governance? That is, how do we relocate responsibility and accountability? Or is it that even possible? And I think that's a really important question. Is it even possible to reallocate or relocate responsibility and accountability for the correlation machine or digital governance? Okay, at the heart of the digital governance is the notion of the algorithm the machine learning algorithm, but other forms of algorithms as well. So in, uh, in uh, sort of sympathy with Karen Barat from her book, uh, Meeting the Universe Halfway, she argues that matter matters. And she says the problem with our society is we think language matters, we think discourse matters, we think cultures matters, but we don't really believe matter matters. And I think if we believe that language, culture, and discourse matters, we should also believe that algorithms matter because algorithms is a form of culture, it's a form of discourse, and it's a form of language. And if that is the case, then why particularly does it matter? And I want to highlight two things, although we can say a lot of things about it. The first thing is the point that we delegate out governance decisions about who's a criminal, who's not a criminal, who's a good applicant, who's not a good applicant, etc. These decisions are delegated to the algorithm. And then the algorithms becomes a subsumed within a larger social material assemblage in which they become obscured from political decision making and obscured from accountability and, res and responsibility. Uh, and this is what I want to refer to as the correlation machine. Now, the fact that we delegate to algorithms and that these algorithms sub can become subsumed and obscure and impenetrable is something that people have talked a lot about. Something they haven't talked so much about is the notion of performativity, that these algorithms do not just, pre does, do not just enact, sorry, reflect a reality, but they enact a reality. So here I'm drawing on the no notion of performativity by Judith Butler. So Judith Butler says that um, something is performative when it produces what that practice already assumes. And how is this performativity enacted? Now, a lot of things here, I'm not gonna talk about all of them. I just want to mention two things. One thing is the notion of scripting. So Latour taught us about scripting, that artifacts, architectures, spaces script our behaviors. So the classical example is the lecture theater, which, or the room which we would have been in, the beautiful room. When you enter the room, it suggests a script. It suggests sitting down, it suggests setting up, standing up, it suggests front, it suggests all sorts of things. So it scripts our behavior. And then as we enact those scripts, we become positioned. We become positioned as a as a part a member of the audience. We become positioned as the presenter. We become positioned as the chairperson, etc. This is what Foucault calls subject positioning. So these algorithms script our behavior and position us as subjects. And as subjects being positioned as subjects, we then become enacted in a particular way. And this connects to the second point which is Tim Ingold, the social anthropologist Tim Ingold's uh, phrase. He says, we're always doing in undergoing. All our doings is always within undergoing. So we both act and are being enacted. And this process of acting and being enacted is the key point I want to highlight. Now, what he argues and Latour also argues is that we have an exaggerated sense of our own agency. Mostly, and this is what Akanaman in his work also shows, mostly we enact scripts, 
mostly we enact the things, the scripts that are, we already take as valid and legitimate. So when I'm in the room and I'm the presenter, there's a set of behaviors that seems to be obvious, valid and legitimate to do. And that's what I'll be doing. If I enter the room and I become configured and positioned as this audience, I would sit down, I would take out my notebook or whatever, and I would enact the behaviors that seems obvious, meaningful and sensible to do. And in that way, I become enacted. So I act and I become enacted. So this notion of performativity is something that I want to then link on, link on into uh, very carefully. Now I'm going to talk about correlational performativity, but there's also, of course, other forms of performativity. We know the sort of performativity that's done by ranking. We know, for example, we are all academics. We know the performativity that's done by the ABS ranking list. It's not just that the ABS ranking list reflects the quality of the journals, because it, it, it's supposed to, because people suppose it reflects the quality of the journals, they then submit to those journals and because they submit more to those journals, the journals have more to select from, et cetera, et cetera. And so they become enacted as the list that reflects the quality of academic publishing. Okay, so the correlation machine. I want to talk a bit about the correlation machine. So the correlation machine, as I said, is about governing effects, okay? So it's about governing effects and that governing of effects happens with three elements. First, we have big data or data, usually large data, big data. We have correlational algorithms in machine learning, for example. And then the key thing is prediction. What it aims for is prediction. The correlation the correlation machine aims to make distinctions between good candidates, not so good candidates, criminals, not so criminal, et cetera, et cetera, and use that to predict the classify, the class that you fall into. Are you in the good candidate or not so good candidate? This correlational algorithms is based on what Kalan calls a calculative practice. A calculative practice, he says, uh, is not about calculating mathematical operations. Yes, it involves mathematical operations, but more importantly, calculation starts by establishing distinctions between things, good candidate, not so good candidate, or states in the world, and imagining the, and estimating courses of action associated with those distinctions and the consequences of that. So this, this is a particular calculative practice, the correlation machine. And it's based on the notion that through color, coloration, correlation, we can have prediction. Prediction, we can decide beforehand, predict, before it's being said, we can know. Before it's said, we can know. That technology embodies this very particular predictor, calculative practice called correlationism. Okay, and correlationism is a really interesting notion of understanding of the world and how we govern the world. Uh, some people refer to this as a post-theoretical world. So, for example, if you go to the work, uh, the paper by Chris Anderson, who used to be the editor of Wired magazine, he wrote a piece called End of Theory. And in this piece he said, there is no better way. Petabytes, 10 to the 15, allows us to say Correlation is enough. We can analyze the data without hypotheses about what it might show. We can throw the numbers into the biggest computing clusters the world has ever seen and let the statistical algorithms find the patterns where science cannot. Correlation supersedes causation. And science can advance even without any coherent models, unified theories, or really any mechanistic explanation at all. His colleagues at Google makes the same point. They say we should stop acting as if our goal is to author extremely elegant theories and instead embrace the complexity and make use of the best ally we have, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. Right? So there's, a, there's an understanding in those two quotes, an understanding of the world in a very particular way, which I want to sort of unpack a bit. 
So this notion of a post-theory world, a world in which correlation is enough, where correlation supersedes causation. And of course, that's the distinction between prediction and explanation. Where prediction is the ability to say that if A happens, B is likely to happen. If C is likely to happen, D is likely to happen. Now, that sort of if A, then B type of logic, of course, is connected to prediction. So I can say if the sun sets tonight, tomorrow it will rise. It will rise. I wouldn't know why necessary, because why is about explanation. And they're saying why the explanation is not necessary anymore because that requires theory and theory is too complicated. Theory has this whole loop that we have to go through. We have to set hypothesis, we have to collect data, we have to test the hypothesis, we have to refine the hypothesis, we have to collect more information, data and so forth. So they say that whole loop of knowing, the loop, loop of theory, the loop of knowing by theory is not necessary. All we need is prediction. Prediction if we get A, we know B is going to happen. And they say, okay, we accept that this is local, it's specific, it's provisional, but it's about the actual world. It's about what's really happening. And the explanation loop is too long and it wastes too much time and resources. In this complex world, what we need is we need something that can respond immediately. That's what prediction gives us. If we know that X happens, then we know Y is the case. Through prediction, we can make these distinctions there and there. We don't have to wait. We don't have to investigate. We don't have to set hypotheses. And they say, this is not a problem. The fact that it's local, specific, provisional, it's not a problem because we are talking about the real world, the actual world. Data is the world. It's not like in traditional explanation where we build theory, we have N that is a, a, a sample of some sort. N here is all. N is all. And through all, N is all, we can actually make distinctions and make predictions and take actions that are relevant now in the world. Of course, this notion of N is all, and that's is the actual world. This actuality is produced very, very specifically. There are a set of calculated practices that produces this actual world. The N is all. Uh, what Espeland and uh, Saunders calls commensuration. So in order for things to become actual in this world of big data, we need to make them numbers. And making numbers, as they show in their work on the sociology of number, making something number is, is, takes a lot of work. And in that work, there are many decisions made about what is quantified, what is not quantified, how it's quantified, etc. What numbers do is they turn quality into quantity. And this is an argument that Bergson has made a long time ago. All right, it turns quantity into, uh, sorry, quality into quantity. But more than that, it takes these sets of data and turns them into massive sets of data. So they say this distinction between structured and unstructured data is no, more, no longer relevant. What we have is we have the vectorization of data into very high dimensional vector spaces, huge vector spaces in which almost every element becomes a vector. And these massive flat files uh, doesn't matter Data from different sources can be brought together. Data from different types can be brought together in these massive vector spaces. In a process what uh, Louise uh, Amor calls ingestion. So data is not loaded into a database, structured into the database. It's ingested into these systems, right? Made part of the system through a process of ingestion. And this ingestion then tr transforms things that are unequal to things that are equal. They are equal in the terms, of course, of the measurement, in the terms of the number, they are equal. And they are turned into something that is now commensurable, no longer incommensurable. But we have to step back and say, this is not 
just any database. This is a very particular database. And here we're reminded of uh, Derrida's work. Uh, Derri Jacques Derrida wrote a book, uh, Archive, Archive Fever, in which he argues that the technical infrastructure of archiving, the archive also determines the structure of the archivable content, even if it's very coming into existence and its relationship with the future. The archivization process produces as much as it records. Okay. Uh, Bauker, Jeffrey Bauker also says this, this notion of prediction is everything is basically, he argues, Skinner, Sk Skinner psychology. As long as you matter just between the stimulus and response, if stimulus and response and the relationship between stimulus and response is what you're concerned about, then you're back to Skinner psychology. We don't need to know what's in the head of the individual, or we don't need to know what the theory is. So this predictive logic that emerges from these massive data sets, which goes through a process commensuration, then embodies a particular logic that is fundamentally obscure. Moreover, it assumes that these patterns that are in this data is relatively stable. That means that the future will be like the past or that the future will be a continuation of the past. This is a really important point, which I hope to unpack a bit more as we go along. Okay, so I want to talk now, I've talked about this notion of prediction, the idea of correlation as being the significant uh, calculative practice, and this idea that this practice, this correlation machine embodies a certain understanding and view of the world. Now, how does that actually play out empirically? How does that manifest itself empirically? So I want to talk about plagiarism detection. And I want to talk about machine learning. Uh, so plagiarism detection. So what happens in plagiarism detection? So plagiarism detection makes the assumption that academic writing or writing more generally needs digital governance. Digital governance in the form that I've expressed earlier. So what Turnitin does, uh, and I'm using Turnitin here as an example, it de detects the correlation, a correlation between the text in the essay and the text in the database, the Turnitin database, which they claim consists of all the documents in the internet, all the academic papers that have been published and so forth. So what does that do? When it matched the text, when text is matched, it identifies it as copied text. In other words, it says there's a similarity between this text and that text there. It's interesting, they don't call it copy detection system, they call it plagiarism detection system, okay? What happens now is these correlation-based detection where somebody says this is legitimate writing, this is illegitimate writing. That distinction is made. Then becomes embedded in inf institutional infrastructures. So for example, in my university and many other universities, Turnitin is a default setting. When people submit their essays, they are by default submitted to Turnitin. There's a Turnitin report generated for each of the assessments. If you go to a disciplinary committee, they want as evidence the Turnitin report. Turnitin now becomes the way in which we make distinctions about non-plagiarized versus plagiarized text. And this has certain performative outcomes. So it enacts the student as somebody that is suspect from the start. The student's essays are submitted all by default. So we treat students as if they are suspects from the start. It enacts the student's writing practice as a craft or a skill of not being detected. It makes distinctions about good writing and bad writing. So some people say, and I have actually empirical evidence for this, they say, what we look for is a similarity index between 20 and 35% because that indicates that the student has quoted 
and has refer referenced his work or her work. A higher one means that they might have copied more than the text. A lower one means they actually haven't actually quoted any text or don't have uh, many references. So distinctions about good and bad writing is now made in terms of the similarity index of fernity. It also enacts plagiarism in a particular way as a legal issue rather than an educational issue. Now, the reasons why students might have copied text in their essays could be multiple. It could be that they are non-native speakers. It could be that they are struggling with the phraseology and, 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 and terms and forms of expression from the subject that they are in. Uh, there are, could be many educational reasons why students have copied text in their essays. But what we do is we treat these things as plagiarism. Why? Because we are governing academic writing. Why are we governing academic writing? Because academic writing and assessments have become positioned as a commodity. We exchange essays, assessments for credits, we exchange credits for degrees, we exchange degrees for employment, etc, etc. So within the commodification of education, it makes sense to govern academic writing through uh, digital technologies, through digital governance, correlation as the basis for establishing the legitimacy of text, whether they did plagiarized or not, and as a result is students start to think about writing in that way and academics start to think of writing in that way. So when they receive a plagiarism report, a Turnitin report, and it has a low similarity index, they assume it is not plagiarized. It also, this, this plagiarism detection governance position ghostwriting services as being obvious and meaningful. Because the students now think of good writing as something that's not detected, and it's a commodity, they feel it's totally legitimate to outsource this task to somebody who could write original text. So what we see is a whole host of performative outcomes that is the result of this embedding of Turnitin and uh, correlational governance as a way to govern academic writing. So what I want to claim is Turnitin does not so much detect plagiarism, it rather produces what plagiarism has become in the world where it governs academic writing. That is, it produces what it already assumes. It produces what it already assumes. Plagiarism is now defined, it's acted upon, is thought about academic writing, teaching of academic writing, all of these things are thought within the prism of the correlation machine called Tenedine and how it's become embedded in the social, social material assemblage that we now call higher education assessments within higher education. Okay. Now, I could do the same analysis looking at, for example, uh, social media. Uh, here is a very complicated diagram of, uh, of uh, mach machine learning. And at every point here, we could look at the, the various ways in which the correlation machine functions here. So in terms of the sensing, the commensuration, the commensuration process, what is sensed, what is sensed, what is picked up, what is measured, how it's made into number, how the data sets then become part of the big data, how that archive is selective, how that selective archive is, is used to develop machine learning algorithms, how these machine algorithms then provide predictions, sometimes predictions and their enactments, such as in filtering, or predictions where we are given recommendations, but with very particular choice architectures, choice architectures that help us make the decision, facilitate the decision. So people like this bought this, so you might want to buy it, etc. And this then produces a particular subject. And the people who develop these algorithms say, 
we don't want to know anything about you. So they defend their actions, the development of these technologies by saying, we don't want to know who you are, what your name is, what anything of those. All we want to know is we want your data. We want your data. Your data is, needs to be made commensurable and sucked up into these hugely dimensional vector uh, databases. And then we can give predictions. And of course, uh, by doing that, they evade the whole question of accountability and responsibility. These then feed back, our behaviors feed back into these correlational models, which then give us decisions, enact decisions, good employee, not good employee, or you might like this product, you might not like this product, etc. And of course, there are many examples of these machine learning uh, technologies. Uh, so for example, I skipped, sorry, go back. Uh, there's, you know, there's the, as I mentioned, the self-fulfilling uh, circularities such as filter bubbles, echo chambers, etc. We've talked about that. And then also predictive policing, which I just want to highlight. So not only is the digital governance a post theory governance, in other words, governance that is not concerned about explanation, but is only concerned about prediction. It's also post-normative. It's post-normative in the sense that these digital governance, and I'm quoting there again from Chandler, modes of government, there is no longer a line of causality, but only a plane of relationality. The shift from causality to re cor correlation or the plane of line of causality to the plane of relationality means no longer do we need to assume a normative horizon or normative goals that are externally to the actual world, right? So these, these machine learning algorithms do not have normative ideals. They do not have normative guidelines or normative senses of what is right or all they're doing is they're making distinctions, good employee, bad employee, based on the data that they have. The good and bad employee, of course, is made through the calculative practice more generally in ways in which, uh, as Kalan says, these modes of governance already imagine the distinctions and what, how those distinctions might be relevant or not relevant. So what we find in predictive policing, for example, if we look at the studies on predictive policing, is this, these technologies are used usually to predict areas of crime so that the police can focus their resources on those areas rather than spreading the resources across the wider areas. So what happens is if the, an area is highlighted through these algorithms as a crime hotspot, police go there. What happens if police go there? They over-police, they identify more crime. And because they identify more crime there and index and, and catalog more crime there, that becomes more of a hotspot. And through this process, people become criminalized for often petty behaviors or petty in, uh, infringements. So what we have is we have a cycle in which people who are policed, already over-policed, become even more over-policed. A good example of this sort of lack of normative horizon is the big uh, discussion that happened around the autocomplete function in Google. Now in the autocomplete function in Google, we had this uh, racist, you know, misogynist uh, type of uh, autocompletes and Google's response was, it's just the algorithm. It's just actual world reflected back to you. That's what the world is like. They, you know, the world is full of misogynists and racists and uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, nationalists and uh, white supremacists and whatever not. Uh, that's just what the world is. Another example was the Tay Tweet bot, uh, which you might remember when it was released, it was supposed to uh, be this bot that would take tweet, Twitter stream and then develop its own tweets and people would respond to that, et cetera. And what Tay Tweet 
Bart became, it became quickly a misogynist racist. Uh, and again, the argument was made, this is not us, it's not the technology, it's just the, the, the tweet bot is just reflecting back the world to you, uh, etc. So there's continuously this fallback on this idea that it's the algorithms are, 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 are neutral. What, what is at stake is, 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 a, is a normativity that's outside of this governance. The governance does not govern uh, normatively, it only governs in terms of correlations. And we know the fake news campaigns, etc. So what's the fundamental issue here? The fundamental issue is, uh, this is just a quote from O'Neill's book, which is, by the way, a very interesting book to read. Uh, what is the fundamental issue here? The fundamental issue is we have governance in a post-political uh, way. So correlation is a very particular, the correlation machine is a very particular way of producing our future. And it's moving from preemption, from prediction to preemption. It's not just predicting the future, it's also making that future happen. And it's making it happen in a very particular way. So Louis, Louise Amor in her book uh, on the politics of the possible, of possibilities, uh, writes this, digital, uh, digital governments as correlation performative, it does me, has a certain anticipatory logic, which is what she says. That is, it acts not strictly to prevent or enable a playing out of a particular course of events on the basis of past data tracked forward or probable future, but to preempt the unfolding of emergent events in relation to an array of possible projected futures. It seeks not only to forestall or advance the future via calculation, but to incorporate the very unknowability and profound uncertainty of the future into an imminent decision. And we can see this uh, notion of moving from prediction to preemption in this quote from a Google search executive. He says, this was in 2011, search is still feels very one dimensional. You give a query and we Google return some results. It needs to be far more communicative. It needs to be able to have a conversation. I want my search engine or my digital assistant to be an expert who knows me the best. It needs to know you so well that sometimes you don't need to ask it the next question. Okay, you can translate that into many domains of digital governance. You don't need to wait until somebody is uh, radicalized. You can prevent radicalization. You don't need to wait until somebody uh, becomes a criminal. You can prevent crime. This idea that we could use digital governance in order to be, to be preemptive, preemptive. So what it effectively says is that the correlation between stimulus and response is enough. We don't need a theory, we don't need norms, and we can make the decision in a preemptive way. Now that seems to me to be a very dangerous set of propositions that is embedded in the notion of the correlation machine. I want to go back to this quote, which was apparently attributed to Viktor Frankl, but uh, that is, uh, I'm not sure about that. Between stimulus and response, remember uh, Bauke said, this correlational system is a stimulus and response system. Now, Frankl, who was a Jew who survived the Holocaust, he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in the space, there's the power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. That opportunity to choose is important because in choosing, we develop our growth and our freedom. The correlation machine is producing our future for us correlationally and preemptively producing us, our lives and our future, according to a logic that such correlation calculation already assumes. We are and will increasingly be losing our freedom to take and produce the future as open-ended, unexpected, serendipitous, 
a horizon of possibilities. This is really important. If the correlation machine will dominate our lives, our future will not be an open horizon of serendipity, unexpected, open-ended possibilities. It will be a set of possibilities that is figured and correlationally produced through these models, which offer us a future, offer us a way to make distinctions between good employees, not so good employees. We'll produce some people as good employees and others as not so good. We'll produce some people as plagiarisms and others as not. This is a very important and I would use Foucault's notion, dangerous technology. Not dangerous in the sense of, I'm not judging it normatively, I'm just saying dangerous in the sense that it has the possibility to undermine some of the most cherished values that we have in terms of freedom to choose. Final slide. So this management effects of effects involves the redistribution of agency understood as responsive capacity and thereby evades the question of responsibility or accountability, Chandler says. So where do we go when this agency is so distributed and the performative outcomes is implicit and then unacknowledged? For example, if I do a view, if I do an interview through uh, the, the interviewing software and I don't get through, uh, just for interest sake, my, my daughter went through an interview process where she was, uh, she was not shortlisted because of the uh, video analysis done by the, um, the software. Where does she go to say that's unfair? This, this, this process was unfair. When somebody is, when a, when a prisoner is given a longer sentence because they are predicted to be a potential reoffender, where do they go to say it's unfair? Because if they go to the algorithm, the people say, this is just correlations. This is a prediction. If you go to the, to the judge or to the person doing the interview, they say, we have thousands of applications. We need to filter them somehow. We filter them, filter them, them through this, this technology. This technology is objective. It's just algorithms. It's just making calculations, etc. So where do we go to get to question the fairness of these algorithms? The problem of unfairness here is not just that it's unfair. It's the fact that the unfairness is concealed through behind a veneer of objectivity, of, uh, of data, of actual world decisions. Where do they go? Do we open the black box? If we open the black box, what do we see? We just see numbers. We see weights in a, algorithm, in a, in a formula, in a, in a function with billions of weights. How do we know which of those weights are producing the unfairness? So opening the black box just means we have more black boxes. Do we do regulation through certification? How do we deal with this, uh, this governance technology? Now, my argument will be that all of those will help very little. And there's a lot of work done on fairness of machine learning algorithms. There's a lot of done work done on transparency and how we can improve transparency. There's a lot of work done on certification to get these algorithms certified as being unbiased and so forth. I think that's all missing the point because at the heart of this is the correlational paradigm. And this correlational paradigm has a particular logic. It's a logic of learning. People in, in learning, machine learning will tell you an unbiased machine learning algorithm is useless. Learning is developed biases. If you learn, you develop biases for certain decisions to, certain, to make certain distinctions. That's what learning means. So the idea of an unbiased algorithm doesn't make sense. What we need is we need a whole scale rethink of the correlational paradigm. We need to really think as a, for example, in terms of plagiarism, we really need to think about education and get rid of turn it in. We need to think about 
the practices and what we value. Uh, we really need to get back to what is at stake here because I believe the politics of our future and how our future is produced is really what is at stake here. And if we don't do that, we might be very naive. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's excellent. I think we can be perhaps unmuted to clap, if that's possible. <laughs>